Welcome, everybody, to the second issue briefing of the annual meeting of the New Champions 2019. Great to have you all down here in the, the belly of the building on the ground floor, far away from the exciting rooms of the village and all the different hubs. Um, this is where we come to get to grips with the real issues shaping the global agenda. My name is Oliver Kahn. This session is on platform, the platform economy. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but first of all, I'd love to introduce my, my esteemed panel who I'm honored to be joined by. Alex Young, Corporate Vice President, Managing Director, Greater China, Amazon Web Services, based here in the People's Republic of China, previously at Dell, previously at Cable and Wireless. We're just talking about our roots in telecoms, uh, moving up the, uh, yeah, the leapfrogging through the technology. Uh, Henrik Nerjox, your Director and Partner, Bain & Company, recently moved to Hong Kong, uh, a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Not anymore, yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> you didn't have to say that. You could have got away with that one. Annie Ko, you're a professor of Hello. finance and vice president of the Office of Business Development at Singapore Management University. Great to have you all on Thank here. You. So to set the context, um, of course, it's a big year for, for platform economies. Um, uh, open season is one word I, I, I read to describe the platform economy and the, the major players recently. We've had tech giants like Tencent and Alibaba recording year-on-year -year profit growth of 50% in 2018. Amazon and Apple becoming the first trillion dollar tech companies in the same year. So they continue to grow and, 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 and the, the question is, have they grown so large that they are now um, outgrowing themselves and, 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 and returning less to society than they originally promised? We have the, the commissioner of the, the competition commissioner in the European um, mm -hmm. Commission describe platforms as the enemy of innovation, for example. So we're here to discuss that. We've got 30 minutes, a very big, very big topic. We try to encourage as much interaction as possible. Stick your hands up. Disagree as much as you like. We've already agreed here that we're going to disagree, so you know, you're, you're, in, you're in very good company. Um, but let's get started uh, straight away. So Alex, platform businesses, politically vulnerable in the US and in Europe. Mm -hmm. Maybe less so here in China. Why do you think this is? Well, I, uh, well first of all, I, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about Amazon as a whole, right? I mean, the thing is like, uh, Amazon started to sell this uh, books, and then uh, with the Kindles, and then eventually uh, in 2006, we started the, uh, the so-called cloud business. And uh, I have to disagree one of the things that the EU are saying, that you know, we lack of innovation. Just like uh, in year 2018, we spent totally uh, almost like 20 billion on research and development, which is actually ranked number one in the world, even mm. ahead of uh, what Google's and Microsoft or Apple's are spending. Now, that, that depends on where you do the uh, R&D. Like here in China, uh, we actually open a, uh, a machine learning and AI uh, development labs here in Shanghai. And uh, we also start doing some product development here in, uh, in uh, Beijing to uh, cater to the needs of the local uh, companies. So I would say the key is like, are you doing R&D for a specific market? And at the same time, we put a lot of emphasis to uh, build the ecosystem around us. Uh, like for example, in the cloud business that we have, we basically set a very uh, stringent target. We do not enter into the, uh, the upstream or the downstream, meaning that we will not get into the hardware supplier, but we will design the hardware. And at the same time, we will cultivate a lot of a uh, uh, system partner, consulting partner, so that we can let all this partner be able to fulfill, provide the end-to-end uh, the -end enterprise solutions to our customer. We believe strongly in this uh, ecosystem. So, and as a result, we will be able to have this sort of a division of labor. We focus on what we do best, which is just the, uh, the core business, I mean the core platform that enable us to uh, you know, really do our stuff really well. Uh, okay. Oliver, can I jump in here? You're, you're starting okay, off sorry, earlier. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I let's forgot. Just, I'm, I'm a it. panelist. I'm not the moderator. But, um, Alex, I'm very curious. So yeah. when did you start coming up with that statement? We don't do downstream or upstream. You know, we keep to our core. When did this realization? It's always we start when Andy Jesse started the business in 2006. Very and nice. we, yes. Yeah, I was hoping that would be the answer. Yeah. I was going to ask you a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but it's a great question. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. Um, and, and yeah, let's, and let's go, and I believe it was fine, and, and please do, because we, we encourage this. Um, and yet, still, so platforms, political football in that case. You know, you, this is capitalism working. You're investing in R&D, you're self-regulating, you know where to go, where not to go. And yet, and yet, just like this morning, we had another conversation around trust in AI. 
that's not getting through to the people or to the public or to politicians. Maybe it's just the politicians who see an easy opportunity to, to reap, reap votes and appeal to their base. Yeah. I, I would say it's actually Amazon, particularly AWS, has a very unique culture. We listen to customer, we listen to the market, mm -hmm. and we develop the product that meet the needs of the customer. Now, as you have read news, you know, very recently, you know, some of the uh, developer complain about our contribution to the open source. So we immediately, within four hours, we go to the Twitter and say, yes, mm -hmm. we acknowledge this particular issues. We will fix it. And we want to be part of this uh, open source community and not just like taking stuff. And, right, and so Oliver, just, just to add to that, what we see with business leaders, they are increasingly recognizing if we don't act responsible with the ownership and usage of data, we have no sustainable business. Yep. Mm. Uh, I think because, because the level of sensitivity, given also some of the scandals, has increased so much mm. that there starts some self-regulation, which most likely is not sufficient, mm. but which is at least a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's good. And this is a starting point, which is, is good for, starting point for me to ask the next question. Um, capitalism in action, for sure. Could we get capitalism to work a little bit better? Or is this capitalism, is this the way it's going to go? I think we agree platforms are not going to go away and it's going to be very, very difficult to, to take any kind of, the kind of action that you know, politicians talk yeah. about. But how can we make this a little bit, work a little bit better? Yeah. Or, or is it working fine just now? No, certainly I think you can always improve. But, but let me take one step back. I think the first observation is uh, we will face a decade of a rise in platforms. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, also referring to the title of this session, uh, pl did platforms peak or I, I don't believe in it. I, because for two reasons, the benefits for the consumer as well as the benefits for the companies mm. are immense. Uh, and, and therefore, I think there are all good reasons to believe that the platform economy will further rise. Now, secondly, I think it's worthwhile to note and, and maybe also to debate, I see much more a pro, pro, a proliferation of different platforms. This will not be the one platform that is conquering everything. Mm -hmm. and, and we see very interesting concepts popping up everywhere where, for example, consumers are connected to the local uh, 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 to the local businesses. And this is independent of the Googles and Amazons and Tencents and Alibabas of this world. And, and there are a lot of these platforms that are centered around very specific purposes, very specific customer needs. And I think they will coexist uh, uh, quite, quite nicely. Mm. I think coming to your point, is it working uh, perfect? There are some risks and, and we have to be honest about it and open. And, and let, me, let me flesh out four and uh, then we can take it up for discussion. The one is basically on privacy. Mm -hmm. Privacy, security, I think we saw some of the, of the scandals. The second is on usage. And, and quite honestly, I think each of us can uh, look at him or herself mm -hmm. Uh, I did an experiment this year with a family on vacation. We locked down our mobiles for two days in the safe, in the hotel safe, and it was fabulous. Mm. It, it, it created totally different <laughs> dynamics. And uh, so I think there is a usage uh, mm. topic that also, uh, by the way, the hardware as well as the software providers be mm. became aware of. Mm. The third is, and you mentioned it briefly, the competition. Uh, the risk of losing uh, the competitive dynamics of entering monopolistic or oligopolistic structures. And I think we also have to face this as in every other industry. And the fourth is something which is, I think, a little bit overlooked, uh, that these platforms are often amplifying unintended outcomes. They are amplifying polarization. They are amplifying bad behavior because bad behavior is more often shared than good behavior. Mm -hmm. They are amplifying a polarization uh, if we think about the political debates and the, the upcoming populism. Mm. And, and these are also consequences when talking about platforms, talking about how can this work, how can we make this work for uh, the public good are uh, topics that we have to tackle. Mm. And, and these are, of course, externalities that are very hard to measure, Henrik, the, 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 social, the negative social 
effects of, of these platforms. Mm. Uh, Annie, sure. let's, let's talk about the international, the, the international angle because inevitably platforms get caught up in geopolitics as mm. well. Um, they go, they move across borders. Um, you know, they get caught up in uh, in discussions, and and if we have uh, Davos in January, we had the WTO announced moves towards um, you know improving the way that digital services can move across borders. Mm. But inevitably, platforms and geopolitics are going to clash. What's going to happen? Mm. So thank you. Good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. And I actually wanted to go down on that topic Oliver mentioned. He says this is a great briefing center because we are going to go down to the deep issues, the real issues. Um, I'm part of the Global Futures Council on the new social contract. And I think the world has changed so much and so fast that we need to pull the brake. So although the topic says has pla platforms peak, and Henry says we are going to see another 10 years of platforms. But the mountain climbers in this room, when you climb up a mountain, there will be slopes to come down, mm -hmm. and then you have another mountain to go. <laughs> so in many ways, I think we have not peaked, but the journey will have its ups yep. and downs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the reason you are getting a lot of resistance right now, Oliver, is that the rules of the game have not been thought through. And I think I was glad when Alex mentioned that way back in 2006, and before this conversation started, they know what they want to do. So the value system is critical. You cannot be digital without looking at the values. And the values is not the value to consumers or values to customer, but your own value of driving a business. And so in many ways, the political equation will always come in because the big elephant in the room today is not more B to C platforms, but actually B to B, and businesses need to globalize. And once you cross border, there is something called sovereignty rights. So I think many countries are learning, and our role, our role on the forum, our role in the audience is to help educate if you know more. I don't claim to know a lot about platforms. I use platforms but I think we need this honest conversation because the rules are not clear, the design is not clear, and many of the platform companies are actually being funded in an exaggerated manner. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually very curious, uh, Alex, when you said you knew exactly what you want to be, what did your investors say? Well, the, what the investors are telling us is like, well, uh, globally, there are four trillion uh, enterprise IT spending. And this is what we want to do, see how we uh, democratize it. Mm. When we democratize it, meaning that in the past, like for example, you know, you know, I would say actually without cloud computing, mm. actually there was no possibility no for machine learning because you have to suck in so much data. Yeah. You need so much computing power to do it. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you have to spend a couple of million at that time yeah. to buy all this mini computer to do mm just for experiment, mm. not even for a commercial use. Mm. With cloud computing, all this cost goes down like a hundred times or even a thousand times. Yep. So it, this is like, you know, to a, in a way, it is a democratization of mm. all this expensive IT spending. Mm. And as a result, it unleash mm. so much innovation, mm. not just for enterprise, not mm. just for startup, but mm. also for individual developers. Mm. The second thing that our, our boss and the board of directors ask us is like, Given that all this technology are being democratized very rapidly, not mm. just AWS, there was other IT vendors are doing this. Mm. How are we going to fill this talent gap? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because machine can be very cheap, right? The cloud computing is very cheap, but mm. your lack of people. Mm. So as a result, we invest a whole lot into working with university, working with research institute, working with continuous study organization. Mm. Uh, just in China alone, for the last two years, we spent uh, quite a bit of investment to train up 120,000 university mm. students. But every year here in China, right, there was about 7 million <laughs> university graduates, still a tiny bit of, you know, drop of uh, in the oceans. Mm. But we're working really hard on that. Mm. The second thing is like even in the machine learning, uh, we were being asked to develop a tools mm. so that even high school students can use, mm. can practice with the machine learning. So I don't, because this is not a product thing, so I don't want to mention that product, okay? Mm -hmm. So our goal is keep lowering the bar of 
this assessment. technology adopts, okay. adoption. But, but, but may, I, may I intervene? Because I think it's not only the business that has to be educated, that has yes. to learn. Mm -hmm. I'm, to be quite honest, a bit concerned about regulators and policymakers. Right. Because the question is, how can they keep pace mm -hmm. with this yep. pace of change, pace yep. of innovation that we see in technology? Mm. And uh, they have basically to provide the guardrails. They have to provide the frameworks. Mm. So I think there is a very big task in getting them to, uh, yesterday I was with Klaus Schwab, he called it an agile governance, mm. uh, to uh, learning, to experimentation, and mm. therefore to adapting them. Mm. Because I think the old paradigm where I'm setting rules and they are valid for the next 20 years mm. will simply not work because yeah. of the technology, right. uh, technological yep. progress. So, so, so to so all of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, that is a, common, is a common refrain. We had it again this morning. We talk about trust in AI. Yeah. Um, and and the, 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 the same problem came up. And I've been in this business a while. And the, the same message is, is always the same. And regulators and governments struggle to keep up with this, the pace of innovation. Um, would you like more regulation? So the lady this morning uh, who worked in AI was actually mm. very glad to have GDPR providing the guardrails for, for which yeah. to, to operate. Is this something that could, could benefit you as, as you, as you look at a, uh, an increasingly hostile political mm. um, landscape? So I wouldn't call it regulation. I'd call it standards, Oliver. I think we want to have the right standards. So again, it's part of social inclusion. Governments should come together and reach a certain agreement. So is it a set of standards that's globally accepted, irrespective of the stage of the development in the economy? Or is it only good for the developed world and the emerging mm -hmm. markets may need a slightly different set? Mm -hmm. So we've not had this kind of conversation. We have yeah. rules of the game for trade, for financial flows, but we have not talked about it from a digital angle and from a platform angle. And who's going to do that? Because getting an international consensus, as we know in this day and age, is not so easy. The yes. G20 is uh, on, a, on a track that is a Zaka track. So mm. who is going to do this? How are we going to get this? So we can't do it globally. So in many ways, I think the ASEAN countries are trying to come together. So maybe with a smaller block of economies, mm -hmm. uh, slightly more similar in culture, in the stage of growth, and then maybe the conversation can start from there. Let's have a quick show of hands. I'm loving this conversation, but it's time to, time to share it with other people. Uh, who wants to ask a question? Uh, just from there. We'll try to take two or three, just so we can rattle through them. Who else? Stick your hands up. OK, sir. Hi, uh, Dale Mihailov, Head of Data uh, at Wellcome Trust. Just a question. Um, I think, um, Alex, y your first answer was uh, a slight pushback against uh, being uh, a break to innovation by saying you invest tw 20 billion, I think you said, in yep. R&D, which is great. The question I would, the challenge I would pose you is one company investing 20 billion R&D versus 20 companies competing investing 1 billion each. Yep. One creates a slightly more competitive, interesting ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Your answer, please. Mm. Well, actually, the answer is very simple. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the last 14 years since we launched uh, AWS, uh, there are so many startups got listed in the stock market. I just can give you some example, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pinterest. Yep. You know, so it, you know, when they started the business, there were only 13 people. We enabled 13 people to come up at that time when they started to say, hey, I want to go for round C investment. That, at that time, that was like seven years ago, that market cap, estimated market cap at that time is already one billion. Now they listed, right? Similarly, like a lift, right? They just got listed. Now it's a 15, almost $18 billion business. So they have their own set of innovation. Again, this go back to what my big boss, Andy Jesse, said. Mm -hmm. We don't do this. We're not good at those things, like how to serve the customer, right, and, and co consumer customer. Let that we enable them, lower the bar of experiment, lower the bar of doing, trying out, all right, or so that they can keep in innovating for themselves. So 20 billion is only Amazon, but if you look at all the startup, now, as you can see, for the last four or five years, a lot of enterprise actually got a wake-up call because so many dis startups are disrupting their business. Mm. So now you can see, right, I mean, about a month ago, Volkswagen announced this partnership with us. Yeah. Why, right? So it's everybody is accelerating into this innovation. And, 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 yeah, and, yeah. and when I was working with Google, and the one thing that surprised me, the whole mindset was, who will disrupt us next? Mm -hmm. And this was driving them. I would love to work with incumbents in my business who have the same mindset. 
they are only trying to defend. And, and I think this is also with some of these scale insurgents, as I would call them, a driving factor of continuous innovation. They are not getting complacent, at least not what I'm observing. And I, I don't want this to be all about Amazon as well, because it, you're, 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 you're exactly. in a good way, because, right. because you're, 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 you're just to model corporate, corporate activity. But let's, let's widen, widen the whole frame. Surely it's very difficult to be disrupted if you're able to spend billions and billions on R&D, if you're on that scale. How can you be disrupted? I, I, I think uh, this is uh, going back to, to Alex's point. Uh, you should never underestimate the bottom-up innovation that is coming up in the startups mm. are often funded massively by mm. VCs, mm. by strategic investors, mm. etc., cetera, and, and that are coming up continuously with new business models. So I think it's exactly the wrong attitude to say, we are big, we are large, we cannot be uh, disrupted anymore. Mm. This has brought all the incumbents, whether it's in the, on the OEM side, whether it's in the financial mm. services industry, into the situation they are in. Let me add to this. Mm. You know, internally we call ourselves as the one of the biggest, the largest startup in the world. Mm. Because the way that we innovate, each year when we do a budgeting, we ask each of the department head will come up with some experiment mm. or new idea. They wanted to try to get some small budget mm. to try it out for six months. If it works, we'll continue to fund it. So this is actually pretty mm. efficient. Yeah. Meaning like that you know, we, we have like you know, 30, uh, 300,000 people. Well, just imagine how many mm -hmm. departments we have, right? So this is actually a reason why we spend so much on R&D, mm. all right? So with that, actually, this is why you know, a lot of startups wanted to work with us. At the same time, enterprise also wanted to see how they can tap into this sort of a, uh, innovation practice. I mm. wouldn't say culture, actually, it's more like a practice. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how kind of uh, make us pretty, uh, uh, making let's progress. Take, let's take yeah. some more, some more I questions. I think people were wanting to put up their hands. Yeah, let's yeah. Who's, who's, who's next? Yes, lady at the back. Uh, was, that, was that a hand? Yeah, okay, so we'll whip the microphone over here. Can you um, let, mention your name, please, and where you're from? Sure, my name's Megan Kaywood. I'm the Global Head of Digital Strategy at Barclays. Previously, I was Chief Platform Officer at Starling Bank in the UK. Um, and I'm just curious, so the whole platformification of banking has been like this massive topic in financial services over the past few years. Mm. So now if you're to go to, go to a conference like Money 2020, every panel is about platforms. And what often happens is they'll talk about Amazon, and what would happen if Amazon started to enter the space, or the GAFAs, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple? And what I'm curious about is, um, from your perspective, one, is Amazon aware of that? Are they even considering disrupting another space like financial services? Or from any of your perspective, how do platforms play in that space, and have they peaked um, there yet as well? Okay, and let's get a microphone over to the lady here in the second, second row, Amazon. please. Financial services. Mm. Hi, it's Morgan McKenney with Citi. And, uh, building on the question a little different angle, to make platforms sustainable, a lot of times there's many contributors. If you think about shared economy, you know, so the hosts or the mm. drivers that are making the platform have true value, mm. uh, or gig economy workers, et cetera. How mm. do you give back some of that sort of benefit of cr content creators, et cetera, in a, uh, to make the platform sustainable over a long period of time? Mm. Okay, how do we give it a little bit back? That's mm. a fair one. Annie, I think you've got a view here. I, I think the gig economy and matching of jobs, I think that's amazing, all right? To me, that is a great platform. I'm doing quite a bit of that in the, in the university. So uh, we use one of the startups that are from SMU alumni, and it's called Staff on Demand, and so they use the algorithm, and they match displays PMETs. So they are the professionals, the managers, the engineers, and they get retrained for uh, matching to a group of small medium enterprises. And how to make it scalable, at the moment, it's not able to. And I'm with you on that. So the government has to step in. So just now, Oliver said there were so many great benefits, but those are social benefits. And people are not willing to pay when it's a social benefit. So the Singapore government paid 70% of the pay and 70% of the training costs for the whole year to you know, take this program, which is what I'm doing. After six cohorts, each cohort of about 25, we have about 250, and I'm looking for more people to come on the platform. But the first question they ask me is, will the government continue to pay? 
And that is the challenge, because if it's a social benefit, then people don't think it's my business to pay. It's mm -hmm. a government's role. Uh, and of course, we put that... Unless we take it from Amazon as a contribution. I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> well, well, well let's come to that. But we, we just, forgive me the shameless plug, we put some um, research out, which we'll talk about in the next session, actually, in Davos, uh, the reskill revolution. Mm -hmm. And we calculated that if, if uh, left to the private sector, it would be only profitable to reskill around 20% of those workers whose jobs are... Uh, you know, a, a fear of displacement. So mm. finding and you know, funding and financing yeah. reskilling is a huge problem. Mm. But let's just go back to that question one more time. So sustainability on the platforms and, and, and giving a little bit back. Alex, any, uh, any thoughts from your side? Well, uh, I just want to take it a little bit further on this uh, education side of this. Uh, in fact, uh, we have piloted uh, in the US and we'll soon roll it yes. out to the rest of the world as anyone who got trained by AWS and certify, mm. we will help them to do job matching. Now, because the technology is so cheap, it creates mm. so much new job opportunity. So as a result, it's create a, you know, a big vacuum, right? Mm. They need certain people with certain certified skills. And the good thing is that they, AWS actually, the skills that they get certified, to be frank, mm. they can use it on M, uh, Google or Microsoft because we actually embrace their technology. So th th that is actually, we're going to roll out this program globally uh, next year. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen some initial success in the US. So I think that is one way that we can contribute mm -hmm. because it's lifting up a lot of the people's yeah. skills you know, into this. And we match area. it to the right domain expertise. Exactly. So yeah. it cannot be one size fits all. Yep. Okay, we'll talk after this. <laughs> yeah. okay. Oliver, may I comment on the, on the question? And, and you have to because. <laughs> But on uh, Alex, Alex FS and, 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 and platforms in FS, because I think mm. uh, this is a very relevant question, and uh, the financial services industry uh, should be scared and is scared uh, about uh, this potential development. Uh, two, three observations. I think the first observation is the question is when they are entering financial services, are they only doing the sales or are they doing the whole value chain? Mm. And, and my sense is I would doubt. Uh, that Google and Amazon, you name it, want to become an uh, insurance carrier, want to deal with all the banking regulation, etc. Yeah. The real risk I see is that they're basically capturing the customer interface, and then you are the provider of a commodity product as a bank or as an insurer uh, to them. And therefore, I think the big challenge and the big imperative for uh, the financial services industry and for the incumbents of the financial services industry is to stay relevant, to produce a lot of positive outcomes, to build ecosystems mm. where the end consumers see a real benefit mm. because you're not only addressing a product need, but you are addressing the real raw customer need. Mm. And there are fantastic examples out there. I think this is not a lost case, mm. especially because you have your existing customer base and despite mm. all the questions, there is also trust it's not trust in the banking sector in general, but often it's trust in your home bank. It's trust in your home insurer. And I think building on that, but not staying with the value proposition that made you big over the past 80 years, 100 years, but basically becoming a real solution provider instead of a product seller. I think this, is, this should be the answer of, of the uh, FS industry, but you will tell us more about your plans to enter financial services. Wow, well, I never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so I'd like to jump in, Oliver. Um, I visited Chengdu a month and a half ago, and there is a bank in China which is purely digital bank. Um, you, QX or something, I can't mm. remember. It's two alphabet bank. What they did was they collected data on the farmers, the unbanked. <laughs> so it's creating that completeness of the market, meeting the unmet need. Mm -hmm. And I asked them a question, so where do you get your funding from? They say it's from the original investors, but many traditional banks have excess funds in the interbank market. So they borrow from the traditional bank, where the counterparty risk is only between this digital bank and the traditional bank. And then the digital bank on lend it to the unbanked people. So you complete that value chain in many ways. So if not for platforms, then those people would not have been able to have access to credit and loans. I think the key is really 
uh, and for any company, whether it's a startup or enterprise, if you want to stay relevant, you really want to spend your effort, as much as 90% of your effort, to innovate on behalf of your customer, to serve their needs. And their needs will continue to evolve, and you have to catch up. If you don't respond fast, there will be other company, because as I say, the fundamental cost of the IT spending is substantially lower. So there is a lot of what, a lot of stuff can be tried by try out by just a couple of guys. All right, lately in the case of Hong Kong, right, they just issue eight WeBank licenses. Why? Because they wanted to use the WeBank to disrupt the uh, traditional legacy bank. But as a result, HSBC also respond as uh, Standard Chartered Bank also respond in their own way. Mm. So everybody wants to st uh, stay relevant. I'm just going to go over time by a couple of minutes and ask one, one last question, if I, if I may, if you'll indulge me. Um, I do hope you will. Um, so we're here in 2019. Platform economies are, are successful. They keep on becoming successful because they're good at what they do. And yet there is political residual uh, opposition to them, um, which is rising. So let's look through the next coming years, over the next five-year time frame. How, a platform, how is the platform economy going to evolve? Or how will platforms change? And Henrik, let's start with you, because Alex has been fielding a lot of these questions first off. So a first observation, uh, we just did a, a, a Bain study, and we saw that the level of willingness to share data is currently going down. Uh, compared Among to consumers? Uh, consumers, consumers. Mm. Uh, uh, so uh, compared to uh, three years ago, about 10%, which shows that if platforms, we will see platforms exiting the market because they are not playing to the rules, they are losing the trust, and then they are out. I think uh, consumers will vote uh, and walk away. And so uh, first, I think some of the now known, well-known uh, well names will stay. Uh, most of them have noticed it and tried to self-regulate them. Mm. There will be increased political pressure, especially because of the amplification of some of the unintended consequences. Mm. And, and we haven't talked today a lot about it. But, and as I said at the beginning, I think we will see also a lot of newcomers in this, uh, in this field. Mm. Uh, will this become all global giants? I doubt. But we, what I said is a proliferation of uh, different platforms for different consumer needs for the benefits of these consumers. Mm. Annie, anything to add? So I think we are at a pivot point right now. I'm hoping that it would not go the way of over-regulation. I'm hoping that we are at that point in which a lot of purposeful platforms would exist and that those purposeful platforms have gone through the rigor of knowing who they are, what they want to be, and work with everybody to make sure that they are sustainable. Uh, Alex, it's slightly unfair to ask you to comment on your, your, your own firm's evolution, but any, anything you'd like to share? Well, I, I think, you know, like, to be frank, you know, there is, you know, particularly in the last uh, five years, people talk a, a lot about data sovereignty and all this stuff. It actually create upside and downside mm -hmm. to cloud service provider. You know, it actually create a lot of pressure to the, uh, the niche player because it's hard, really hard for them to uh, manage all this uh, overhead, regulation overhead. And uh, so with, with that, then, you know, the big, the big lane actually getting bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. to be frank. And how we can do it, you know, uh, be able to, to, to help is like what Andy mentioned early on. It's like we need to have a set of rules. Like, for example, the data exchange between U EU and the US is still not perfect, it's yeah. but still improved, mm -hmm. has improved. And then with that, then how ASEAN country be able to exchange data right. properly mm -hmm. with EU and also mainland China, how to exchange data, all right, going in and out, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, right now at this, at this moment of time, it's, it's just mm -hmm. none, yeah. right? You just like, yeah. Everything is protected, mm -hmm. right? Encapsulated, mm -hmm. right? But actually, it, to be frank, the, the way that we look at it, right? If you want to exchange goods, if you want to do financial services, mm -hmm. there is exchange of data already. Mm -hmm. How you regulate this? You, you can regulate it properly. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities. Don't over-regulate it, but you have to regulate it, protect individuals' uh, mm -hmm. confidentiality. Some more guardrails and some more rules and uh, some more understanding. Right rules, yeah. smart rules, yeah. oh. smart standards. I hate the word rules. I think you said rules, actually. Rules, smart the rules standards. are not clear. <laughs> smart I wrote, standards. I wrote it down. Thanks, guys. It, a fascinating conversation. And Thank it, you. Always a shame that we, we don't have longer, but hopefully it's given enough 
um, thoughtfulness to take forward into the next two days of this meeting. Thank you so much for joining us. Alex, Henrik, Annie, thank you so much for thank you. being thank with you us here. This session is now over. Thanks for watching us live online. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.